great. So hello everyone, my name is Katerina Anastasiu. I am a facilitator in Trans from Europe and today I have the honor to technically support this uh, webinar organized by the Marx Fem. Uh, and also my colleague Heide Marie Ambrosch, who will be take caring, uh, taking care of the moderation of this webinar. For the beginning now, I will try to make sure that everyone has their settings correct, because as you know, and you can see, we will offer interpretation today. So I will ask all of you, also the attendees that are not visible now, to follow my instructions. If you move uh, with your mouse cursor to the bottom of your screen, given that you are inside the, the Zoom client, uh, on the right side, you will see a little button uh, called interpretation. Please make sure to choose the language that serves you best. And at the bottom of the menu, you will see a button saying mute original sound. If you want to avoid listening to the speaker and the interpretation at the same time, then click on that. This means that uh, when you do this, you will only be able to listen to the channel you have assigned to yourself. Eventually, at some point through the webinar, somebody will be speaking and you will not have a sound. If this occurs, it means that what was, has been said was not relevant to the webinar, but rather a technical matter. Also, in order to help the interpreters to do their job best, sometimes the interpreters will be switching, which means that if you have two, three, and up to five, six seconds of silence, then don't worry uh, the interpretation will come back again. Just don't change and play around with your um, uh, with your settings. Additionally, on the right side of your screen, you will see a chat. If the chat is not visible right now, then you will find it again at the bottom of your screen as soon as you move over, move over with your cursor. Uh, click on the chat and on this chat you can communicate with us uh, doing the technical moderation. And next to the chat button, you will see a Q&A button. This is the space where you can post your questions to the panelists. And uh, later on in the discussion, we will uh, read out some of the questions that have been posed in the Q&A. Yes, this would be a small introduction. Also, I would like to remind you that we will be recording this webinar and it will be later on um, published in the page of Transform Europe and we will make sure to disseminate it in all channels of our partners. Uh, I think before I give the word to Heidi, I should say also two, three words about Transform Europe. Transform Europe is the uh, research and uh, network foundation of the European Left Party. Uh, and you will find more analytical information on us on the chat posted by my colleagues. And now I would pass to Heidi so we can kick off our discussion today. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. A very good morning from my side. A technical housekeeping remark. If I turn off the video, um, the reason is that in my building, in my home, there's many children doing homeschooling and sometimes the internet connection is a bit poor, especially in the morning, and that would help them in facilitating do their work. But um, if I speak, I will turn on my camera, of course. A big thank you in particular to Frigga Haug and for committing herself and agreeing to assisting and being a part of the seminar. I have uh, actually been trying for 40 years uh, following her and I'd like to mention three milestones to kick off these meetings that have struck me time and again. One, a text word of women are victims or perpetrators and that was a liberation for me. We had many self 
discovery groups in the 80s and there was so much suffering and few options to act and the text I'm referring to uh, is based on Feuerbach, goes back on Feuerbach and Marx on their thesis and it has opened our eyes that it's ourselves that we have to uh, work for our liberation and based on that idea and I'm making a big jump now we I worked on Frigga's theory on the relations of the genders or the sexes and uh, in the core of Marxism to put that into the worlds of production and a new area of research was then opened up regarding labor and the labor relations and uh, the relations people uh, take up and I guess that is uh, due to the 13 theses uh, we have now in front of us and then the third milestone a vision to interfere to intervene to get political guidance and orientation so a big thank you to Frigga for your input which we're going to listen now and I'd like to mention that Frigga had a birthday on Saturday and I hope she has recovered from celebrating her birthday and before that I'd also like to thank uh, all other speakers in this round today I'd like to thank uh, Nora Retzel who has been instrumental uh, in providing content for the second uh, conference in Vienna. Then thank you, Diana Molinari, you and your team then uh, facilitated the conference in Lund. And then Jule, and uh, I think it's been two years that she's working on the preparation of the fourth conference in uh, Bill as they say in the Basque country and uh, she's giving us a very refreshing input from a younger perspective and then let me add one thing in the first uh, round of discussions we will have Maria Vandreel I'm happy that she will be making a contribution here sharing a position from South Africa so this brings me to the end of my introduction. We'll have um, those sh short inputs published on the chat and I give the floor to Frigga. Thank you, Frigga. So we haven't tried if it's correct. Thank you. I'm very happy to be with you today that after all the difficulties we managed to at least act as if we're having the fourth international Marxist feminist conference. I would like to even call my contribution like that, remembering the project of a feminist Marxist international. The word memory in German is also something historical critical and it's also a reminder we should assure ourselves of the reasons that made us get together and depart from that memory and not just losing our path not just getting lost in everyday life but uh, memory is also a reminder in german now I'm going to start. I will start in history, in the beginnings. What, which questions did we have? This has a reason you will find out later. At the beginning of the new feminist movement, which started in different parts of the world, but not in the socialist countries at the time, but also in the so-called developing countries. I was in a lot of these, of these developing countries. Everywhere it started with uh, three questions that are not interlinked. The first one was the body, the body of the women as a property, not by, sam by somebody, but of the woman herself. 
understanding the body like that and also um, the right to abortion the right to abortion as you all know uh, the state plays a role because it's a legal question and also church with its morals until now uh, their position is not to um, to abort if you're watching old movies about how it all started today it's almost not imaginable about anymore it is horrible for the women how the church got involved in this question how the church everybody was very happy to leave church for that actually i myself i'm not part of any church So that was the first question, the body, the body of women as a property and the right to abortion. The second one, the unequal distribution of housework and in society, therefore, because women being very connected to their homes to keep the homes in order, the subalternity of the women and also of their rights. I don't know what it was like in the countries, in other countries, even though I wrote about that, but I do remember that when I was still studying, that women weren't allowed to have a job without the permission of their husband. Today, that's unimaginable. It's so anachronistic that either the father or the husband had to agree. I, I had to make sure to keep my child after divorce, but I couldn't get a job because then I couldn't take care of my kid. So they really got involved in everything that was in the 60s. There was a very big Congress in Frankfurt in the Paul's church, Paul's Kirche. Today now, uh, there's a lot of dispute what kind of position it should have in history, this church. So we thought we have to go to Paul's church and introduce women as historical subjects. So that Congress was called human rights don't know gender and that was in brackets like so it sounded like human rights have gender that was the second question the relationship to the workers movement that was very strong at the time that was the third big question so because it was all about who do we want to conduct our political work with. For example, on the 1st of May, on the day of work, where, so the decision, where do you walk on the march and which posters are you holding up? And so on. So the affiliations, it was very, very important. It was very important who you march with of course what the um, enthusiastic women's movement was of course naturally a part of the workers movement but on the other side it was also exactly not part of it because it had to do her own thing and then the study of marxist theory so they would have a reason and, and know what the position of the women in society is, to find out why are women marginalized in society. We somehow have to study this. If we cannot change that, we have to be more radical and go back to the roots. 
studying Marxist theory was was a duty to all of us women who were enthusiastic because first of all women in Marxist theory did not really have a place wage labor is something that men do and women don't work also in Marx you see that the the male is always the breadwinner even Marx says that and that's even the exact way he says it you may know that from his works it's it nobody talks about the reproduction of the workers but the wage laborer has to have enough so he can care for his family then there was Engels who with the working class and he says the defeat of the female is so if you Um, so if Um, so I'm taking over from my colleague and uh, in the history of the labor movement this was uh, accepted even during the Russian Revolution you see that Lenin wanted to actually free women from the dumpness of their daily household work to liberate the workers women are no subjects of their own, they are only victims and uh, in the famous work of Engels this uh, low level care work is a blind spot it's not work at all, not considered as being work and even with us in the Federal Republic of Germany when the left was founded somebody said as of now, thank God, my wife no longer has to work. She can go back to the old patterns. And uh, that means women don't have a history, not even in Marxist theory. They have to actually work on their own history. That is a work for generations. And it has only started in the women's uh, movement with the women's movement and there's some good news in this context in the dictionary of critical Marxism where we try to actually reflect parts and address parts of the history of women's movement I said housewives I spoke of uh, the term housewife and of a cook and uh, we would think there's masses of documents to work on that but there's no documents, no lexicon, no manuals where you find, find an entry 
on the history of women's work, everything has to be developed from fresh. And the good news is, in this dictionary, critical dictionary, I think we have now reached volume number 15. And it's not only we're getting translation of the first volumes into Chinese, the first three have already appeared and been published, but also in Latin America, in Argentina, at the Marxist feminist group is dealing with the translation of the those volumes that deal with women. The first volume has uh, just uh, been published in Argentina and uh, it takes some entries up and develops and discusses them. As we are criticizing Marxism, as we're seeing so many discrepancies, so many blind spots, so many contradictions, the question arises, are women human beings at all? And since when? So the question is, why should we appropriate uh, Marxism? Why don't we turn it back to that, as many of the emerging women have done? If uh, there's so big criticism of Marxism, and here I have a simple answer. Marxist theory stands for an analysis of the deep structure of society. It is necessary in order to be able not to be deceived by superficial mainstreaming or equality. And if women get equal rights, and if you have women in leading positions, if you have share, proportionate share of women in bodies, in company bodies, you would believe that we've achieved everything. But no, don't... Uh, be misguided. This does not reflect practice, does not reflect experience, and does not reflect the thoughts and the feelings of so many of the masses. But women are still marginalized. They are secondary. And uh, this is something that spreads across all walks of life, at all spheres of life. Now, if you... If we want to do something, we need to bring about change. Many people will have to work on that change. And I had hoped initially, when I had said I would attend Bilbao and make an input there, I would have hoped that I would meet there many wonderful Marxist women who would help in our project and who would actually volunteer to um, work on those entries in the dictionary and in Germany there's no more Marxist women left there's nobody available to help us do that job and uh, I would have hoped that uh, with Spain with Bilbao we would kick off this uh, work on the dictionary maybe that we could uh, have four or five keywords relating to women out of this massive volume of entries in that dictionary and then as we are fighting and struggling for understanding for enlightenment for findings if we want to change our society and this is something we have to do if we want to cope with and deal with the marginalization of women, then that would have to mean that we all empower women to do that. And uh, that would be a huge program, a huge effort in education and training of women and young girls. That should be part and parcel of our endeavors. I had a dream, and that dream is that uh, there's one big uh, institution, a university, a scientific institution where all those activities could be pulled and bundled. I summarize that into one thesis, humanization of Marxism. I'm not quite sure in the meantime whether humanization is an appropriate uh, expression, a fitting expression. It might be phrased differently. Perhaps we could rephrase that. What do I mean? I mean that if we have Marxism as it is, the way that we have the male provider being supported, that uh, wage labor is uh, 
not for women. If you think of all these uh, blind spots in existing Marxism, if we discover all that and explore all that, that would mean that the decline or the ingression of feminism into Marxism is a renewal. It adds life to it. It criticizes what we have and that means that the Marxist theory of feminism can be critically explored uh, so that it would enrich Marxist word. And I think this renewal, this adding new life to Marxist theory is something that uh, we could call humanization. But of course, we can discuss this term. And then? This would mean that uh, this work is a reason for us to continue the Feminist Marxist International because in this way we learn about the different varieties. We can listen, we can learn, we can talk with one another and see what the situation is in the different countries. And uh, I have so many examples, but perhaps they only relate to Germany, one example. That is typical of Germany and cannot be translated to other countries. Heidi said in the beginning that we have the thesis of the victim and the perpetrator. She said that no regime can work without the agreement, without the consent of those who are suppressed. It has to fight for this agreement of those So we have to all agree to being suppressed. We already agree to our oppression. So this is, it's the case that in Germany, there is a very small communist party that we collaborated with as a magazine and what we also friends with. but excluded myself from the left because this victim aggressor thesis, I rejected it. I pleaded for an, uh, the, for applying the Feuerbach thesis on women. So I lost all my students. Inner Marxist work has to be continued. We have to study it critically and revive it. That's in itself a reason for continuing the Marxist International. The existence, existence of it is a first step. The second thing is that Heidi mentioned the study of the women's movement and women's oppression shows. If you read through, through all the relations in the different countries, you know that gender relations are relations of production because how people produce their lives has to be studied and the relationship of the genders with each other is codified in it. In capitalism, that means the dominance of profit production, the, the long time, on the long uh, time, this destroys. You see that capitalism is not a way of production because the relations are impossible because the fundamentals itself are destroyed. And working historically critically means put into practice 
is something that uh, Rosa Luxemburg calls reaction, revolutionary real politic. That's something, that's a term that we have to use and continue using because it is just so clear it combines two elements that seem to not go along the revolution element and the real politic uh, reform and revolution in one concept that means that everything that's wrong and that is a problem we can tackle that way we can use it as a compass this real politic now we are in finisterra we we sit in bilbo we got together we gathered in bilbo this is the end of the world the finisterra and that means that the ships when they land when the fishing boats land they can't because they will just have to stop because there are rocks and as a consequent you just don't have you just can't go there but you have to have a compass to find out how you enter the port without dying and that's revolutionary real politic. The next thesis is who if not us. I talked about this with Heidi before. We wanted to propose that our proposal is if we shouldn't call our manifest that name, who if not us who should uh, research gender relations as relations of production, if not us. The version I had prepared for you, you can find on the internet in a detailed way. It also encompasses what we have to do for it. It's about the history of our struggles and the experiences of our struggles, like Marx that females have to know their situation and really know uh, their own knowledge. It's a necessity that the standpoint of women is necessary. It's not just sectarian. And that's why I added the text of Rosa Luxemburg because she's a Marxist and nobody really called her a feminist. She's actually quite far from taking up the woman's perspective. In this quote, she uses the feminist perspective even though you all have it. So it's also on the recording because it's so um, so interesting. A world of female misery awaits deliverance. Here the wife of the small farmer groans, almost breaking under the burden of life. There in German Africa, in the Kalahari Desert, the bones of defenseless Herero women bleach driven to a cruel death from hunger and thirst by German soldiers. In the high mountains of Putumayo on the other side of the ocean, unheard by the world, death screams die away of the martyred Indian women in the rubber plantations of the international capitalists. Proletarian women, poorest of the poor, those with the least rights, hurry to the fight for the liberation of the female sex and the human race from the terrors of the rule of capital. That's in volume 4-1, page 112. 
in the beginning, I talked about the liberation from subalternity, which has also to be seen from the inside. We need something that Rosa Luxemburg calls education. And if we don't liberate ourselves, it remains without consequences for us. That's already the declination of the formulation. Only capital has to be got rid of and then women can be liberated by the workers, but not that way. It has, it, if we don't liberate ourselves, we won't see the consequence of it because we were, uh, we were also um, suppressing ourselves. We need to study oppression theories, liberation theories, also in feminism. We need a method to to experience our own socialization, how it really happened. We need to find out how we grew into this society. Being an active part doesn't mean being just a functional part of the society, but changing the conditions in which we are active and defining it like that. we have developed a, a specific method for that and that's memory work that's the method for the libera liberation from subalternity and revolutionary realpolitik according to luxembourg and self empowerment as political subject being a feminist marxist subject Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, he inspired memory work. He proposes memory work was inspired by Gramsci, actually the other way around in the prison books. If we want to discuss that, I can present you that. He says education for the many has to be organized that you show that you can um, do can, you can get an audience if this focus is really um, emanating warmth. We socialist women, we introduced an autumn academy, which is different in any country, of course, what you can do in the framework of that, which uh, focuses on societal changes and it's about studying the classics. So it's twofold. So we want to revive and review. If we go into connections, what does that mean? Since the beginning of the women's movement, other movements who are not wrong or we should not fight against them, such as the workers' movement, since our beginning, they try to make the women's movement ridiculous. They try to ignore us. And then when it becomes stronger, to just incorporate it. This is always happening and this is true for any kind of movement. Not giving into that um, leads to internal fights and needs to the fact that we need to strengthen what feminist and Marxist uh, struggle is for the women as actors in the general uh, liberation struggles have a special responsibility. And this is thin ice now. I hope you help me, you will help me formulate this because women 
I don't want to say that women as human beings are different than men. It's about humans. But within humanity, women are in a special responsibility because reproduction of humanity happens through their bodies. This means uh, there are half of humanity, of humankind, who are equipped with consciousness and with responsibility for the catastrophes happening in the human nature relationship. Nature is not a subject, but humans are subjects who are to blame for everything that happens. The female part of humankind, as Rosa Luxemburg says, is not only different and in, in oppressed in a more horrible way, it's also excluded from, from academics. Uh, men are 800 years ahead. That's what you see if you work in academia. There's so many blind spots because women were just not there in academia because they haven't been working academically. It's all codified for men. So if you look at the French feminists, they say, so strange, two men are in a desert, they recognize each other as equal, but also different, as a different human being. And that's the beginning of humanity. And they don't have kids, they weren't born, they're just ready and can meet each other as two individuals. So that the whole philosophy, the whole Western philosophy is internally male, codified for males. And that's what you notice if you start working academically as feminist Marxists, that gives us a special opportunity for uh, the education of girls and women. It's undeniable that Marxist thinking is um, academically based or it's not. And if we have to work internationally is something I don't have to add. I think it's all about the global oppression of women. And once again, Rosa Luxemburg's words, who manages in very short sentences, she manages to, to uh, voice important concepts. It's just a small sentence. For the property bourgeois woman, her house is the world. For the proletarian woman, the whole world is her house. So it's about us, uh, it, we want to make the world a better place. So we have to conduct all of our struggles on a global perspective, even though they have to be uh, led on a very local level. In that way, we want to read, find out, hear, experience. We want to know which kind of resistance was possible. What can we generalize? All these different power forms are um, form a node of domination. I came up with this concept because it's very important because you can see that if you are just trying to work on one problem, it will become even tighter in a different place. That's what a not a node is all about. All the different power relations are interlinked and and it's uh, very hard to solve it, to loosen it. So all threads have to be loosened at the same time in order to, to open a knot, to untie a knot. The motions I wanted to table that we should discuss for the 
really the in reality the the conference next year that will actually take place in real life so to speak let's see if it's actually possible next year so that's what i uh, a motion i want to put forward first the expansion of our thesis uh, for the practices of the everyday life of the cultural and with the, the work with the subjects in subalternity. We want to formulate that more clearly. Maybe we can introduce a working group for that. And the second motion is, let's not, as we said before, to, uh, to follow the intersectionality of class, sex, race, but let's work on the climate crisis the class relations, gender relations, and the relation of humans and nature. Let's discuss this. So where we, when we discussed class ra uh, race, so these are some points we have not discussed yet, clearly. Frigga, could we perhaps uh, have a break here, listening to those proposals? Could we make a break here? We have had quite a long stretch of time. Yes, that's what was my end anyway. I wanted to come to a conclusion here, almost. I almost wanted to end. I wanted to end with an optimistic view. If we work dialectically, if we see contradictions as a driving force and there's so many crises around us uh, and uh, if we see that our situation deteriorates, corona, natural disasters, etc, uh, etc, et then you will see that there's not only pessimism but there's also reason, strangely, a development of self-awareness of uh, society, of women. Never ever in history have we seen so much social responsibility being practiced during the migration crisis and now during the pandemic. And uh, there is uh, as I spoke about subalternity of women, there's an incredible development of the self-awareness of women during my lifetime. And the first echo from Poland, a historic country, an occupied country, and in spite of all the riots in Europe, it was a reactionary guarantor against progress, especially against women. There, we still have to carry on our fights with the second women's movement and the fight, uh, starting with the fight against the ban of abortion. And now they are trying to make the abortion laws even stricter. Not trying, they actually implemented this new law. Even if the child has congenital misformations, there is no right to abort. And the echo was that 73% of the people in Poland are against this new law. There's a de development in Poland around women's questions in Poland, in society. And uh, today they were the heroes of protests in literature. Women were uh, celebrated as mothers who raised their sons uh, they lost them to the wars and then they could carry on their work, uh, Gogol, Brecht. Uh, and now we're seeing that in Russia, in Belarus, we're seeing a big insistence and courage and competence of women raising their voices, angry women wanting to take over government, while we are still fighting uh, and having disputes against the ban on abortion. So our scale is very small, small, whereas in other countries we see seeing grand schemes. Uh, 
So there I said they want to take over the government because they feel they are fit to organize that properly and uh, we see that there's been a, a defense of men and fighting violently against the patriarchism. So this is lethal, this is fatal, but still what we're seeing and what we're learning is that another world is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frigga, for this optimistic outlook you gave us. And I pass on to the panelists. First of all, Nora Retzel and Diana Molinari and Gayet Fakia from South Africa. They were instrumental in uh, uh, facilitating the second conference in Vienna and they published a book on that. Nora, I think you have the floor now. Okay, thank you very much. Hello to everybody. I'm try to be brief and remain under the five minutes that we panelists have. Um, just to start, one of my, or oh no, the main uh, issue um, that, <coughs> sorry, uh, that um, uh, drives my work in terms of research and also in terms of practices is the necessity to connect. I think one of the main problems of the left is that it is perfectly able to divide itself into innumerable elements fighting against each other more than they fight against the enemy. So I think something that we should have learned from the history of the left is that what we need is connection. As I'm working on the relationship between nature and labor and, nat and human nature and um, external human nature, um, the splits that I see are the splits between ecofeminists, feminists, socialists, ecologists, the ecofeminists work in the area of subsistence work and care work, the feminists working predominantly in the area of care work and the socialist ecologists working predominantly in the area of industrialized work and service work, uh, predominantly in the, in the global north, one has to say. So what is helpful? So what can Marxist feminism contribute to these issues, to these questions, to these separations and conflict? And I think here, uh, Frigga, you have done a really fantastic work in developing the notion of the gender relations as relations of production. Because I mean, I think precisely this kind of concept is able to um, connect uh, the different ways or the different domains in, in which different parts of the left in the ecological area are working. Why? Because um, I think what we need to see is that all sorts of work, all domains of work are subsumed under capitalism. And this includes household work, unpaid work, and care work, subsistence farming, everything that is often by ecofeminists seen as something that is different, that is kind of good, and that can be an example for all kinds of work. Uh, to overcome capitalist uh, relations of production. I think if we think of um, the gender relations as relations of production, what we see is that the production of life and the production for life are domains that work like communicating vessels. That is, if something happens in one area, that will have repercussions in the other area. Maybe communicating vessels is not the perfect term because it doesn't put into the center the relations of power between the two areas. But just to think that, for instance, uh, if, we, if we think of it like communicating vessels for a moment, we can see that there, the care work is not something that can happen in an area of homogenizing spaces or in the housework. But if something happens in the area of the production of work, it will immediately affect the way in which unpaid work and care work is conducted. 
And I give you one little example. For instance, the burning down of the Amazonas that is in the center of our concern at the moment everywhere uh, is done, for instance, to raise cattle. This cattle is needed in order to produce leather that are then used, for instance, in German Porsche cars. So you see the connection between that. And that destruction of the Amazon destroys subsistence work, destroys the work of women in the farming and the unpaid in the household, and also has repercussions of all the work that is done in the global north. So if we think about gender relations at relations of production, what we learn is, and I think, and, and what we have as a perspective for research is that all kinds of work are in the, within the struggle against capitalism and all kinds of work need to be liberated from this privatizing, exploitative relations of production in order to overcome the situation we are here, we are in, in terms of the exploitation of work and the exploitation of the earth. And that means, and I finish with that, that there is a need for coalition and cooperation and common struggles between all the peoples, male, female, and other genders in the global north and the global so south, because our kinds of work are all connected and are connected in a way that they are exploited and privatized by the capitalist system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nora. Diana, you'd like to continue to carry on? Diana? Okay. I'm trying to explain uh, what I think are fantastic ideas within the thesis. I think you have to switch your interpretation off, I, I believe. Would you prefer me to speak English so everybody can understand me directly? Okay, so let me continue then. I was saying at the beginning of the thesis, there are things which moved me. The idea of hope, of collective knowledge through practice and togetherness and also the respect um, towards intellectual work, which is being menaced nowadays by fundamentalists. This is a very beautiful work, which, as I said, moved me a lot. So for me, it's a privilege being able to cooperate in such a beautiful project. I agree a lot with Nora that the concept of agenda relations as relationship of production is very important um, because of different reasons as Nora's. Mine, well, I believe when we speak about gender, when we are talking about relations, we don't need to identify the heterogeneity of um, the term women. We don't have to speak about racism, uh, sexuality, and so on. So we don't need to, to speak about the heterogeneity of whoever carries out this work. And I think this is a step forward. Then we have also the relation uh, between imperialism and capitalism from an analytical point of view. And I think uh, that's also a very beautiful concept from an analytical point of view. Okay, and finally, I would like to say some things I would like to discuss. I said these couple of things are very beautiful. I would like to protect them and develop them. 
I'm not so sure about the marginality of women. I believe we would need some studies on that. The same way capitalism and um, patriarchalism has transformed, we also need um, such studies about women in, in the context of financial capitalism. I'm just saying, I believe there's some change going on and that we need to understand what the new position of women is. And then related to memory and to genealogy. Um, the experience of feminists in Latin America. We have been on the one hand at the forefront of many other social movements against racism, um, protecting the earth, also anti-capitalists, um, as they call us in, in Latin America, usually they don't say Marxists, they say anti-capitalists. I believe we need to think of ways of cooperating, of integrating, and also think that probably there are no Marxist feminists, like pure Marxist uh, feminists. They are always also related to some other struggles. So um, these views of feminism uh, are usually integrated in some other uh, struggles. Well, sorry for having moved around so much. Um, and as I said, thank you very much, Frika, for organizing this. Um, and Nora, I, I love um, arguing with you and I love you. And thank you, everybody, for your great work. Thank you very much, Anna. And I now give the floor to Julia. She has a bit more than five minutes because she's uh, uh, preparing the next conference and this is why she has more time. Thank you, good morning. And as I said before, it's a great honor for me to be here with all of you, with these historic personalities and we're all preparing the Marx Femme Conference. We all are participants of the organizing committee of the next Marx Femme Conference. And I have learned so much from all of you in these past three years. And as my colleagues have already done that before me, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna summarize, pick up on a couple of ideas that Friga has mentioned today and things that we have been discussing in these past couple of years as well. So I really like the phrase, who if not us? That's a title that Friga had proposed for a possible feminist Marxist manifesto in which the first sentence would be, a different world is possible, definitely. Our struggle continues and that's our hope. It's not that much of the idea of achieving paradise, but we can always keep on fighting. And that's very important because that's the first step against being resignated. Uh, that's for me, at least, that's the one thing that disturbs me the most. And then the other point that I have found very interesting for our group as an activist is uh, we are a theoretical critical group here in Barcelona. It's very important to have a look at the third thesis that Frida has reminded us, which is the relationship of um, production or relationships of gender. What we need to analyze here is what does that imply for us? And I think that in the beginning, we need to have a conceptual framework that is de developed based on the patriarchism the same way that we are developing framework concepts for colonization. And we need to be able to see how they are connected, how they develop together, how this is patriarchal capitalism developed because if we do not have these conceptual framework from the patriarchy or the colonialism we're always going to be thinking in terms of one single 
conceptual framework and that we need to open this up again so we can think about the implications it has when it comes to relationships of gender being relationships of production. What is it what you want to see with this precisely? Because we need to define it. We cannot just use the same definitions that are carried to us. We need to use the ones that are the most suitable. That's why we're Marxist, because we use the one that is the most useful for us. But so we need to define what do how do we define this? What position, what importance do women have in production? Because if you analyze everything, having a look at where women's are when it comes to producing additional value or surplus value, we need to think, are we talking about the real, the right production? So that's why we need to formulate the theory of social production. We cannot use the same term for biological production and social production because we don't produce things, we produce uh, um, subjects. We produce mammals and these are subjects and these mammals, they're not workforce. We need to produce a subject, a subject that can be workforce. And that's why we need to use language and care. Care, not as an affectation, but as work. So the same, in the same way that we need machines to build cars, we need care to be able to produce subjects. And that's how we need to redefine this entire thing. It's one of the most important points. How are we gonna define that production? Is we're gonna have only one social class? Because we don't have to be afraid of having two or three axes of dominations and different social classes and see how they interact and how they influence each other. Because if we don't do so, we all think that production, work, class, emancipation, all that, we're going to be seeing it from a framework that has been excluding this kind of thinking that we're trying to promote here. So I believe that the different theses, that's why I was really happy when I read these 13 theses that were got made me really happy. I think we're all on the same page. We're all on an international level. We're all talking about Marxism, about feminism and anti-capitalism, right? So on the one side, thanks to all of you, thanks to this generation and everything that they have done previously, which is a groundwork what they have done. What are we talking about when we're talking about unpaid labor? And how do we translate that into value of things that we produce? For example, 4% of the gross internal product, uh, gross product from the world comes from care work, right? We know that. So now we need to try to help the next generations to work with this as well. And you have to start looking at work in a very different way, not only regarding the capitalist properties, but also when it comes to the patriarchal relationships, when it comes to a national level or colonial level as well. Because these are sub alternate things that we need to have a look at, not only from a material point of view, but from all these different point of view, different kinds of domination that we have. On the other hand, we also have to take into account how these production relationships are linked to the mechanisms of exploitation, of exploitation not only of people, but exploitation through the fam heteronormative family and in general the androcentric structures. Because patriarchy, like colonism, is a particular system of material production. We are not something that's symbolic or souls that are somewhere around there in the ether. Being a woman, is something material as well. So we need to describe this material faculty. We, it is not reduced to economic production as it has been defined before. It is so much more. Our first materialism, our first material is our body. But since everything has been done from a patriarchal point of view, a misogynist point of view, this has been eradicated from the entire concept. So that's something that when we talk about violence, we're talking about economic violence, for example, or all kinds of violence. When we talk about women who are being marginalized and they usually talk about symbolic violence or cultural violence as if, as if violence was symbolic and something that's just fluttering around there in outer space. And we're talking about 
symbolic violence, but it's a semiotic dimension uh, that is related to all material things. It's not symbolic. It's not fluttering around there. It's something very real that is a material violence that is bringing us to a marginalized position. So that's why we have various complexities that I would like to mention. That it's really great that we can work on it with the group that you suggested, Friga. We talk about looking at these theses one by one, and then when we go to Bilbao and after Bilbao, um, we have the possibility of looking at these and see all of the complex issues that are implied that I'm interested in. Because it's not only about the we women are the ones who are working more than others all over the world and all over the world we have less financial power it's not that we have less cultural and uh, symbolic capital and when it comes to symbolic we're talking about the capacity of producing our own emancipatory categories and not to have someone else to produce it and we adopt we need to produce them ourselves and we need to explain and I just want to recap, uh, come back to the topic of social class. Uh, we're not talking about subalternative bodies or subalternative bodies, because why, why are we talking about classes? Why are we talking about groups and not classes? How are we going to define a social class? Because we need to be able to explain that we not, it's not only that we work more and earn less, but they're actually killing us because we are women. They're raping us because we are women, not because we work more, but because we're women. And housework is something that men are not doing in their home, not because they're men, not because they're workers or white, no. It's because it happens all over the world in all social strata. It's something that we need to understand is patriarchal colonial patriarchism. It's a concept, it's a system that has been developed on the basis of patriarchism, out of patriarchy and colonialism. And that's something that we need to discuss. How can we use what we have seen in this thesis in this context? What is the difference between a feudal patriarchy and a capitalist patriarchy? So, we have to have a look at it and there is research on that. We just finished a research study on that kind of patriarchy here in Spain, in Europe, where we divided the patriarchy in six different dimensions and we had looked one dimension after another, analyzing it. And we see that we have a liberal patriarchy. And as Diana has mentioned, it is a patriarchy that is, has an algorithmic governing and neoliberal governing that is based on industrialist capitalism as well. So it also implies services, for example, and finances and programs. That's what we need to look at when we analyze patriarchy. It's a capital patriarchy because it's not the same. It's not the same as we had the beginning of the 20th century or the middle of the century. But I think I already talked too long, right? Haven't I? Heidi, do we still have time? No. Okay. So anyway, I'm going to come to a close. But as I said, I am quite excited because we have so many things we need to think about because there's so many new things going on there. And there is so much violence going on. We have the relationship of patriarchy and capitalism. It's going to be brutal, but it's okay because the resistance that we are doing today, it's going to change that system in future as well. And it is part of our resistance. That's what Nora said before. It is complicated. Of course, it's complicated. It's more complicated than being leftist or a right wing discussion. Why? Because the leftist people, they do not want to uncover, they do not want to expose the subalternative voices. But that's what we are doing because things, if we look at a subalternative dimension, it's all much more complex. So that is the great problem, but we like it when it's difficult. We like to fight, we like to struggle for what we believe in. And uh, that's why I would like to finish mentioning this in thesis. We have thesis number 12 and thesis number 13, which says that our resistance is a resistance that is expressed in different geographic, cultural, and temporal ways in order to, as Mark said, overthrow all the relations in which we are degraded, enslaved, and banded, and, dis as, and despicable being. We will continue, as the thesis says, to organize the Marxist feminist congresses. And that's what we're going to do as feminists, as women who are not simply in charge of keeping the peace while men continue with their warfare and they are the ones who are governing. We are not going to be reduced to this kind of politics. 
that reduces us to our bodies. We're going to govern our bodies, our communities, our world, because we can govern ourselves. We don't have to be governed. And we cannot be emancipated by someone else. We emancipate ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yula. And for the first round, I have Mandri Fandrell, our voice from South Africa. Could I invite her to talk to us and share her thoughts? Could we have her video started? Marie, are you there? Give us a minute to, uh, to do this, a couple of seconds. Well, we are pressed for time. Hello. Maybe we can take some questions from the Q&A box. I think you can hear Maria already, Heidi. Yeah. Yes, Marie is here can with I us. Thank you very much um, for the question. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. Can I start? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for the invitation and I think for this feminist international initiative. Um, I would like to pick up, I think, on what Frigga raised about feminist international and what happens in different countries. And for this input, I'd like to really focus on what we did during the COVID-19 working class campaign and then engage the 13 Marxist feminist theses. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about the COVID-19 working class campaign, it's an organization based in Johannesburg that consists of casual workers, community health care workers. Um, it also consists of extended public works, you know, small contract volunteer workers, small independent unions that don't fit into the bargaining council to small or kicked out of the bargaining council as well, tenants, et cetera, and so forth. And I think the big problem we were facing under COVID-19 was how under conditions in South Africa where the majority live compressed in squatter camps, in formal settlements, with no water, et cetera, they were going to survive the COVID um, pandemic. And so I think under neoliberalism, increasingly, if you want to fight neoliberalism, you have to be a feminist because you have to feminize your struggles because of what neoliberalism has done to restructure society. So. What we found and what we find in, in, a, in a South African context, and I think in many countries of the South, is that wage labor is a minority. For the majority of people, they live in the informal sectors, they are self-employed, they are reclaimers, they are community health care workers. The biggest employer, so-called, of volunteer casual labor in this country is the South African government. But they have no benefits, et cetera, nothing. But people also work from hand to mouth. They find ways in informal sectors in terms of surviving. So also we find here in terms of the labor movement, which I think you prioritize quite a lot, that the unions and not just in South Africa have become obstacles to progress, obstacles to organizing the working class as well. And they've been locked in to really just looking after their, their members. So I think the first point for us is your first thesis. I think neoliberalism has restructured society. It's, it's limiting to focus on wage labor and on the labor movement because it puts the majority of the working class outside of the historical um, process as marginalized labor. And that most of them are women because neoliberalism also has centered the position of women in society, which takes me to the second point. Um, under the lockdown as well, what we saw was violence from the state. And I think this picks up on some of the points Jules uh, raised. The hard lockdown in violence of the state, employers, the violence of poverty, etc. troops coming in, forcing people to be compressed in their homes. Um, and one of the major things was, was food security, which is the responsibility, as we know, of women. 
And so one of the things people had to do was to organize food and food parcels because of the burden on women as well. But that led to a lot more organizing in terms of taking up issues of domestic violence, et cetera, because women are also put at the center in terms of, in, for men, not only did they have to see to food, but they were beaten if they didn't also look for the drugs and things like this and the alcohol that the men wanted as well. So this comes to, I think, really a, a critical remark about your, the, the second point about violence. I think we, you talk, you know, the thesis talk too broadly about violence in terms of its pre-capitalist, the sediments of its pre-capitalist sources, whereas what we find today, systemic violence is is capitalism and it is based on capital accumulation cannot take place without violence and at the cutting edge of this is women because of what they have to do in terms of reproducing life and the means of life as well which will take me then i think to the second the third point which i think jules picks up as well and it's the question of how do we link these different forms of life and the means of life. And I think what we see increasingly is women, this is being blurred. And the, the main actor or the main social actors in this are women, because they are increasingly responsible for the reproduction, the, the reproduction of life as well as the means of life. In South Africa, and I think this is a trend internationally, is for single women-headed families. And I think this brings together most clearly just how both spheres, the sphere of the means of life and the sphere of life is, in, is, is gendered. It takes place in work, workplaces, in homes, et cetera, the way it's reorganized families. Um, and what I think has helped, I think, as a concept is the unity of social reproduction. I think talking about two productions and not actually making the link theoretically leads to the danger of maintaining the dichotomy between the two in terms of, um, and not bringing together and being able to master the social forces and to make those links because women have to move between both spheres. And in fact, as we know, social reproduction takes place comprehensively in many, at many different levels. And how then do we actually organize for an emancipatory project? And at the center is once again, women. And then my last point, um, and I'm very conscious of the time, is the question of, as we were organizing women, what became very critical was looking at the unity of theory and organizing. Because once the women were organized, the important point was to understand the world, to be conscious subjects, purposeful actors. So we organized a feminist caucus. We met every Thursday. We did first five, 10 minutes. We looked at exercises, et cetera. And then we dealt with the theory and had to deal with issues like, what are social classes? What is the role of the state? Yeah, what is patriarchy? How does it take place today? What are its different modalities, taking into account issues of tradition, of culture, et cetera, and so forth. So I think it, what is important and as a reflection also on the 13 theses is that it focuses too much on research yeah and you know on contemplating the world whereas i think you know what marx was I, I think was important um in his summation was the point about philosophers theorizing the world and the importance of having to change the world and so i would want to say that in terms of picking up on what frida frida has raised about another world is possible our efforts and our focus needs to move to how do we mobilize to change the world? How do we subordinate the theory to the praxis, to how we actually try? And, and I think this is a point that Nora raised in terms of the cooperation, the, the looking at how this mobilization, and as I say, for me, increasingly if you want to take on the struggle against neoliberalism which includes the ecology which includes nature etc you have to increasingly be you have to be a feminist
So uh, I, I would like to, you know, we would like to to really develop this, these thesis and really respond to the thesis in a much more um, cogent, coherent way, um, given that, you know, the limitations of this input and uh, continue collaboration and debate with you. Thank you very much, Heidi. Maria, thank you, Maria. We only have half an hour left. We would have needed three hours, actually. I, uh, we, we're going to take up some questions from the Q and A box. I think some were already answered directly. Maybe one or two that we can use for the final round. Yes. Katharina, please. Thank you, Heidi. Um, so, uh, yeah, first of all, thank you to my colleagues, Tatiana Mutinho and Barbara Steiner, who have been picking up the questions coming in the Q&A box and directly answering them when it was possible. There's still three open questions. Uh, one of them uh, regards the last point uh, that Maria already made. Um, what are the strategies uh, in the fight against capitalist patriarchal uh, oppression systems. Then um, the second question, I mean, it's not a question, it's rather a comment, I think, um, asking Frida to elaborate a little bit on the communicating vessels she mentioned. And then um, there is a question, how can social movements be involved as co-creators in the project of Marxist Feminist International? Yeah. And uh, there was a question on quotations and sources, but this is being taken care of. So the two main questions for the speakers for the last round would be, what are the steps and the strategy in order to open up and include social movements in the Marxist Feminist International? Thank you very much. I would like to add to about the proposal of Friga still preparing the next conference in Bilbao and maybe we want to establish this working group she proposed to further elaborate the thesis. Also Julia mentioned that Friga has already introduced some new thoughts. Maybe you could also introduce that. Who wants to start? Nora maybe because you were directly asked. Sorry I just needed to go to the English channel. Um, the communicating vessels, what I, maybe Frida could answer that better, but since I use the concept, she can correct me or add on. And uh, what I meant with the communicating vessels is to say quite bluntly that I see a tendency within some feminist research to conceptualize care work as something that is not part of the capitalist system of exploitation in terms of being a good kind of work, you know, like caring for people, bringing up the children, caring for the old, caring for the sick and so on. What I want to say with seeing that as communicating vessels is that the forms of privatization egocentrism, exploitation within the work process also take, takes place within the care work itself, itself because it is part of that system. It cannot be somewhere in a harmonious little ball where it deals differently. It is in itself contradictory. You know, it's also care, it's helping like Building a house is also kind of care because it's caring for the needs that we have. So what I want to say is all kinds of work that happen today are at the same time, simultaneously, productive, creative, um, caring, and simultaneously exploitative, destructive, and privatized. That is one point. The other point is what happens in the area of the production of the means of life, uh, the way it is organized, 
is immediately connected to the production of life. To give an example of our research very shortly in Volvo, Mexico. The workers at Volvo, Mexico did not earn a living wage. The way that they could survive was by relying on their partners to work extra to create uh, care work that was needed and was unpaid. And the only reason why the workers could survive on a non-surviving wage was that because capital could exploit the family work, the unpaid work of women. This is just a small example. This of course happens in society at, at large. So what I wanted to um, emphasize was the need to see the connections of these domains of work, but at the same time, the way in which both are characterized by the character of capitalist exploitative work, even if it's care work and unpaid. Thanks. Thank you, Mora. Jule or, or, the, uh, or Diana, or should I just give the floor to Frigga? Frigga, there's a lot of contradictions. Actually, there are no contradictions. Also, what Nora has explained. Power is a network. What I called a node of powers. Oh, that happened by itself. It just slipped up. I'm sorry. I think also about the question of Nora, the communicating vessel as a pick as, a, as an image. I don't think it's so good as as good as the power node, because the different um, different moments of liberation are directed towards each other in their existing structures. If you're going past your borders, you are leaving the area of something else. I think it's easier to understand uh, when looking at the women's struggles. The working class worked towards have, having their own wife, but that's really um, something very offensive to women. So every worker has his own wife. So you can immediately imagine if you read the capital, what happens if there is no wife with the kids? You can immediately imagine that. Even if military reproduction doesn't work anymore because the working class is just became too small and health is ruined. Everything degrades, uh, but still they, they fought for each worker having his own wife. And in this community, now that's too complicated right now, it provides that single people can survive, but we don't want to live as singles. As you already said before, everything is interconnected that's still separated. And going past these borders, it's something violent. It opens up all sorts of channels. Um, I think it's not even, it's not becoming clearer now. I'm, it's because I'm thinking at the same time about what said Diana and that I'm, I'm just going to start at that point. Diana sent us something about the second round, analytical and theoretical. The Marxist theory is all good and fine, but it's not humanism. 
ethic, ethics and humanism is something else. It's not inside Marxism. And I wanted to contradict and I wanted to make it very easily so that everybody can understand. Marx wanted an ethical project. He saw the working class in its horrible situation and, and uh, founded the first international just like ours because we wanted to explore the situation of women in the world. We wanted to debate it and improve it. But now, going back to Marx, and he wrote a manifesto, and it's a bit about the categorical imperative. It's ethical through and through. All relations, I think Jule quoted that already, all relations, throwing over all relations in which men uh, is a debased, enslaved, neglected, contemptible being, overthrowing all these conditions, that's something that everybody should write on their bedroom walls. It's about throwing over all conditions and the benchmark is an ethical one. At the same time, the working class was founded and he, and he analyzed the relations of production. And before that, the separation from farmers and the land and their transition into wage earners. Somehow, the submission of women, her, their instrumentalization, at the same time, it's the desperate attempt in weird conditions to find um, a way out to liberate elements. All these different uh, powers form a node and the limits have to be passed by everyone together. It's not about the liberated wife, the liberated wage earner. It doesn't work that way. It's all assembled. And there has to be a draft. And how are we going to do that? That's the most important and the most difficult question. How are we going to do this? How are we going to have a theory and practice that doesn't exclude anyone, that goes beyond limits, and by doing that, produces wounds? The best teacher for this problem is Rosa Luxemburg, because she sees the suffering in it. She's the one, maybe, you didn't know that, but she's the one who phrased that capitalism is, has not only conquered the whole world, but when conquering, it, it assumed all the women. It didn't only destroy them, but it went beyond that. The task for us is extremely difficult and can only be solved simultaneously. Everything that we start, we need to see what it also destroys. So we need to, we need to see it as defined that nobody should have their wife because being a wife is not an existence that is is something in our liberated world but then we have the problem who takes care of the children who educates them what about the health system with other words we have to take over the government at the same time 
we have to take over the government. And that's why I ended so on, on such an optimistic note, because in Belarus and in Poland, they got so far as to, it's, it's not about abortion. It's not about this struggle alone. It's about the whole government that has to be changed. And within it, and how can we, how can we achieve that? That's again, Rosa Luxemburg's program. There are no idols, there are no books. There's no theory where we can learn that from. So let's learn it while doing it. We all have to start doing it. And all your efforts should be directed to to empower everyone to take the things in their own hands. And let's not wait for anyone to tell us who was left and right. And that's when you, what you see when you, when you started inside the women's movement, you see how, how the single individuals uh, become so much more once they start doing it. Those who are mute can suddenly speak and can suddenly um, drag others along. So our message, the message inside Marxism and the communist manifesto, inside the categorical imperatives is something, is an ethical formulation as well as an enthusiast, enthusiastic one. It's also everyone at any time any moment in time, critical, self-critical, experimental, and always rediscuss questions. Questions might be different, but for us, it's an ideal place if we for once don't have a digital discussion we have to report each other where we managed to um, to progress in the different countries so that many people managed to achieve something. I think Nora wants to say something. Nora? Just very, very shortly, I wanted to connect what you said last, uh, Friga, to what Maria said, because I think that was exactly her point, how through organizing and at the same time having um, uh, contexts where you learn and where you develop your own theory, that is exactly the way in which we can learn also internationally, how in different contexts, in different international contexts, women and other people <laughs> are doing exactly that through organizing, also learning and creating their own concepts and theories. So I just wanted to say that that is an important element that can also be discussed at the next conference in the way in which Maria suggested. So we are reaching the end of our webinar. In the Q&A box, Somebody asked about the lack of queer, transgender, Marxist perspective. And maybe Yule can explain that and elaborate on that. We've had uh, many reactions to the call that ended in March of this year. And we had many inputs which we received. And uh, in, in what we got for the preparation of the next conference, I do see we need to include those concepts more strongly. Julia, would you like to comment on that? Yes. Well, on one side, effectively, yes, there are many panelists, many communicators um, that are talking about this topic as it has been defined. And what I propose here, my idea regarding this question, 
is that I think, as we mentioned it before, it is necessary to try to interpret um, the th theory from a materialist point of view. Because as many other things, all of these currents, and we know it because history has shown how it's been, you can, for example, put a theory on the table and this theory can be used by different groups and be interpreted in different ways, which is what has been happening now with this theory that we're talking about today. So we also have to talk about the theories that before being theorized in this way, they have already been practiced, the queer theories, because it is a theory that comes from the working class. It's a group of practices that comes from the working class that is then theorized about by different people, not only academics, but also activists. And what we need to try to do is we need to try to understand the material dimension that this queer theory tries to transmit, because the queer theory is a perspective regarding the materialism and the materiality in the body. It's a new perspective. It's new. And that's what we need to focus on and politicize it and collectivize it, because it is very important, because a queer theory, if we look at it as a material thing, it's one step towards the disapparition in the reality of the categories, of the basic categories that we find in the patriarchy, which is man and woman. So they use strategies, political strategies, bodily strategies, or corporeal strategies, to be able to dissolve those patriarchal categories. One strategy is the disappearance of genders or hybridization, and then the other one is the multiplication of the genders. And in our strategy, if we have an emancipatory objective, then this objective, the one that we are trying to drive forward, is doing without binary gender concepts. Because that's something that's very fundamental, uh, it's very fundamentally present in the current patriarchy. Because it's something that has came out of materialism, out of politicization. And if we want to be emancipated, regardless, we need to use that because we have seen many papers on this topic before and for the conference for as well. And they are very good to put them on the table and propose political strategies that aim towards eliminating binary ways of thinking, which is very patriarchal and very colonialism because we have to remember that this all of this also has a colonial um, perspective, not only a egocentric one, but also a colonial one. So this will open up new political practices that are emancipatory and that consider all of these aspects. And of course, this will also give us a very good basis to work and to go forward, not only the human materiality, but of everything, of all the material all around us. So I think that's something that we need to think about and work along those lines. Diana, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, but I do not want to say anything more. Okay. If that is the case, let's come to the end. And I have a proposal I'd like to pick up and I'd like to all invite you to actually contact me. And we had a similar proposal in the chat that before our real conference, we'll have another webinar in spring and there perhaps we could work on our theoretical structure and foundation. So not about thesis and expansion of the thesis, amendment of the thesis, changes of the thesis. That might be an idea and I'd like to discuss that with my co Basque colleagues, how we can handle that together and host it together. That would be one proposal so that we can proceed uh, step by step to take things forward so that we don't have to wait for the real conference but that we do some groundwork ahead and do some in-depth work on some thesis ahead during an uh, online seminar. Diana. Thank you. 
I think it would be good if we could maybe make some kind of a division of labor and do something before we meet again. Maybe we can, I, I, I'm not saying that we should write five books, but maybe we could all each write one page, uh, con focusing on one concept or one part of a thesis, and that will help us advance with a more concrete measures because I like to see you and I'm always really happy to see you all, but it's also nice to work with a text, right? So my proposal is that, yes, I think it's a really good idea to do so. We should do it, but maybe we should do a bit of a division of labor and um, maybe someone can just pick a topic and comment it, right? Yes, I agree. Well, perhaps Yule and Elena and all the others that we could develop a concept of themes that we break them down, that we send them out and then we'll ask you who would like to work on which particular thesis and, and come up with one page as a basis for our discussions further on. What do the others think about that? Very good. Very good, says Frika. Perfect. I think uh, it's three minutes to 12. I'd like to thank everybody for the professional work, the interpreters in the background. On Monday, we had a rehearsal and there were some technical hiccups then. So it was good to have that rehearsal because today everything worked well. Thank you very much, Karina, Michaela, Romy, who have we, uh, our interpreters in uh, Spain, Javier, etc., etc. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to my team without Barbara, Katerina, Tatiana. This would not have been possible for me to do that day, do the preparations. They make sure that everything is posted on our website, that it's on Facebook, that it's put online. I'd like to thank the panelists, Frigga, Nora, Jule, Diana, and Maria. I'd like to thank you all. And the only thing that is left to say to me is uh, uh, let's enjoy our good future cooperation. Thank you very much. <laughs>